Interior CS, thank you so much. You said you were not sure why you were called to give a leadership talk. I believe you've inspired men and women here today. Makofi Tafadali, ladies and gentlemen, I, I have a few questions for him. Together with the group CEO of KCB, Mr. Joshua Igara, I'd like to invite you back on stage. You can also clap for him once again, even as he comes forward. Still a young man, jogging up the stairs like Barack Obama. Joshua, thank you so much. And you can contribute to this conversation. Menti.com. Please log on, send your questions. We'll have codes on the screens to the side, and I'll start taking those questions immediately. Joshua, you're giving me permission to ask CS questions. He doesn't get asked on TV. Absolutely. Intimate ones. Yes. CS, you've spoken of strength, resilience, character. But I want to hear from you. Was that something you learned in your journey in the civil service? Or was Interior CS Matiangi a leader in high school, in university, where you were prefect? Help us understand a little bit about your background. Thank you, Wahiga. Uh, well, first of all, it's true. I've held uh, leadership positions before I came to government. But uh, I think, to be absolutely honest, uh, I go back to how a lot of us partly are a sum total of how we were raised. I was raised by very simple uh, uh, peasant parents who believed in one thing. I, I normally tell my uh, siblings, the ones who did not, who are growing up when my parents were a bit older and therefore much more tolerant uh, than, <laughs> than when I grew up. <laughs> I, I remind them of uh, the narrow and straight we had to walk uh, when we grew up. And uh, raised by very strict parents who insisted that one plus one must always be two. And uh, that, that's how we grew up. I mean, we've never known anything else. I mean, we've just known just that. That's how, and, and I frankly um, could like to really celebrate my late father. Because I was raised up by a very strong uh, father who had uh, the conviction that you had to do the right thing. And my father told me every time, uh, it's always good to be truthful even when you are wrong. Uh, so so uh, live straight, live right, and do the right thing at all times. And then, so throughout life, yes, I held leadership positions in high school. I held leadership positions at the university. I was uh, the CEO at some point uh, before I came to government. But what is important in my view, you know, I, and, and this is my view, I may be wrong on this, but what's important is that the core of what you believe in and the core of what drives you, uh, which is your faith in God, and to live thankfully, to thank God that what I have and what I do is a privilege. It is not a right. There are thousands of Kenyans that President Uru Kenyatta could appoint to cabinet. It is a privilege that he asked me to serve. And for that, I remain grateful. And one way of remaining grateful to God is by doing the right thing and ensuring that I do not let my president down and don't let the country down. Wow. CS, one last question before I bring in Joshua. Before you are leaders from all walks of life, corporate leaders in universities as well, and every day they have to make tough decisions. But I can only imagine the kind of decisions you have to make, CS, on a day-to-day -day basis, decisions that could affect our relationship with our neighbors and so forth. Do you have a formula? When you look at a scenario where there are multiple options, how do you decide this is the way forward for Kenya? First question is, what is right? What is right to do? <laughs> that, that, for me, that's the first question. What is the right thing to do here? That is how you will arrest your brother, for example, if you find him in a mistake. That is, what is the right thing to do? Has he broken the law or not broken the law? If the answer is yes, he follows what the law says he's supposed to follow. What is right? That is the first question. What is the right thing to do at this point in time? Not what is convenient or what is expedient or what is, you know, or what is politically correct or what do I think will earn me clubs? when I go to the public or how people are going to shout my name and so on and so forth. There's one thing I need to tell you, Wahiga. Every time, and the other day when we were dealing with, and if I have to be contextual, the other day when we were dealing with uh, the, the issue of um, gambling in Kenya, 
A lot of people used to walk up to me and tell me, oh, you know, you have annoyed a lot of powerful people and so on. And I said, that has not been my problem because of one thing. <laughs> you see, when we introduced changes, for example, in the Ministry of Education, uh, somebody even said, I had, you get resistance every time, but what is the right thing to do? Ultimately, people see what the right thing is and that what you have done is actually the right thing. So, so you will face resistance, and if there is any frustration you get as a leader, is the frustration of sometimes it takes time to build consensus. It takes time to get everybody along, for everyone to see that actually what you, you, are, you are doing is the right thing. And you can be discouraged, and you can lose hope. You can even stop doing what you are doing. Because you get discouraged, sometimes you feel a lot of people don't see what I am doing to be the right thing. But ultimately, people are happy. And you happy in the media in Kenya today about digital migration? <laughs> Yet you actually... Today I'm wearing a different hat, yes. Exactly. <laughs> that one we'll talk off camera. Yeah. So, so, yeah. Yet, uh, you know, we were hammered left, right and center, oh, you know, by, by everybody. And you see, at that time, people even rightly told me, you will not survive. There is no one who has actually faced off with the media and survived. And I said, I'm not facing off with the media. I am doing the right thing. The right thing. What is right? For me, what leads me all the time is, what is right? Do the right thing. CS, thank you so much. Joshua, let me bring you in. You're quite passionate about leadership in Africa and the challenges. In fact, one of the first phrases you said when you got up there was the failings or failures of leadership in Africa. And yesterday, you hinted at the individuality of African leaders. We don't collaborate. And Strive Masiwa is quite passionate about collaboration. And what I was waiting to hear from you yesterday, and I said, when I see you today, I will ask you this. Why are African leaders afraid to collaborate? And what are we losing when we don't work together? I mean, so I would say just two, maybe two more points. And, and I've been privileged to, even when I, in my previous life, and you know, I work very closely with the late Bob Colimo on uh, leaders that see the same perspective. You know, CS is talking about what is right. The reason why we don't collaborate is you're one person during the day and you're one person when you're with yourself. It's almost impossible to build a collaboration now, I am a strong collaborator. I work very closely with Sylvia and the team from Safaricom for many years. But it's about deciding what is, what is right. This is the biggest challenges we face across our continent. But two things I would say that we, how do we overcome? So in the journey of transformation and leadership, one must be able to be confident and be aware that without contradiction, not everybody will agree. I don't think leadership is about agreement. When, when it's about right, you need to be aware that some people will never come on the side with you. They will never support you. But focus on the journey. I call it this nudge forward, or I say stretch. And that stretch is actually what changes and creates change for yourself. So we haven't done that many times. Many times we're so worried. I challenge the leaders, young leaders today, that if you're worried about people challenging you, then you don't have the courage. People will always have different conversations about, we shouldn't stop it from going where it's right. This is one area we face. And then number two, many times we, are very, we have stuck with history. I said this yesterday. We are almost completely numb, we become numb. Whereas we should be moving towards our destiny, correct? Which is the change that we see. I mean, we are a very blessed continent. We are a very blessed country. And many times what, what the CS is saying is actually quite exciting that this is how we have done it. This is history. And we are locked in in chains. And some of them could be cotton wool chains, right? But they look like they are real chains. And that's what we need to be able to do. Now, the forum like this, which is my last comment, is why we are setting up and partnering with South Africa is to create a movement. Yeah. And, and I was very much, you know, Kenyans misunderstood uh, when we, I was a member of the Boys Club. <laughs> yeah. I, was, I was a young member. Feel free to clarify. I was a young member. <laughs> but, but what I found, in, what I found in, the, in the Boys Club, I found a team or coalition of people that are prepared to nudge forward. It was not always easy. So I could plug into a team that was willing to extensively extend their abilities to transform. Now, if you, if you stay around people who are not moving the same direction, and, and Polycap is here, so Amalia, we fought a lot with the industry on many issues. And this is what I would say, that the collaboration must be driven by those that believe. So this is a challenge for leaders. You're going to arise and start lead. You're going to do something. We always wait. I said yesterday, we are waiting for another person to come and do the change. This is a concern for the continent. And that person in reality is the person in the room. So if you don't raise the conversation, which is what we are doing in this conversation to move forward, naturally collaboration 
Yeah. One of my biggest uh, person I admire most is I engage very frequently with the president of Rwanda when he was setting up the free trade area for the continent. And at that time, people said, you can't get countries to join. I mean, a few months ago, we are already more than the minimum countries are required. Already required. So, so this is what lacks. The, the, the courage, I mean, and the fear is real. I mean, the fear, people will tell you, no, people, even your, your friends, you know what you call friends. <laughs> but if their friends are not really taking you on the journey of your destiny, I challenge you, even from a biblical point of view, or even if you're not Christian, even if you're Hindu or you're Muslim, if they're not leading you to the direction of your ambition or your destiny, then those friends will never deliver value to your life. So you make a choice and you run the race and you run the course. Well, wonderful. CEO, I want you to briefly speak to the young people across this auditorium. They look up to you. You're a youthful leader. You have led a huge bank to you know, amazing heights. And they're sitting there. They have their dreams, their visions, but their voices, either internally or externally, telling them you can't make it. How was it for you? What kept you going? What was your formula, your mantra that kept you pushing on to get to where you are right now? So, so I must salute, we have a number of young people here. Some are coming in from Yali, some are coming in from Acumen, some of them are coming from my own foundation to Chajiri. And wh what I actually have found in my conversation with young people is that they're, they're quite courageous. What, what is lacking is, what, is what the reference point to say, are we firm as a leadership? I find the conversation very different. Most of them are very much looking to catalyze but you need someone to be very firm and say this is the direction. So what I've always said from the beginning is that uh, it was very strange when I was appointed a CEO for, for, the youngest, for the youngest CEO. And I said, look, and I remember the conversation a journalist asked me on my first day on live TV. He said, but you're incompetent, right? You have no skills. And Anastasia remembers this conversation very clearly. I actually chose not to answer the question and I moved, him. I moved on. Because ultimately, what defines you is not what they say. What defines is what you believe and you're convicted and you're willing to put everything you need. That's what the young people need to learn. That conviction is what changes you as a person to progress. Now you can fail for it and you will make failures. But we are, as a person, as a leader, I am a sum total of the learnings and the lessons. So failure is something that should not distract young people. In fact, if you, ever have, if you have never failed, I'd rather you have never grown. So you should be able to be confident with failure, but learn from it and build ourselves. This is what I can encourage. And then lastly, is to get a way to mentor and give back. So what I challenge all the leaders is to learn to give back. What the CS is doing today is sharing its lessons. Many times, there's no value of living ourselves and living a smooth life individually beyond ourselves. In fact, I always say that if leadership is about impacting beyond self. If you haven't impacted beyond yourself, you haven't provided the leadership that you have. And that is a challenge I'll give the younger people. Profound. Let's give uh, Joshua Igara a round of applause. I hope we have some questions coming in. Menti.com, put in the code, and I can get them to our panelists here immediately. Uh, and before, oh, wow, okay. We already have some up. I might have to come a bit closer. Dr. Matiangi, what motivates you in life? is what an audience member here today is asking you. Well, I normally um, say I, I get asked sometimes by journalists, what, what's my ambition in life? My ambition in life is to live for God and to do the right thing while I have the opportunity to do the right thing. And that's, that's really what motivates me. And, uh, and um, nothing inspires me more than to see change and, and uh, to contribute to change, change in people's lives and to affect people uh, in a positive way. Uh, frankly, I think that, 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 that is what encourages me. When, when, you, when people's problems are solved um, and, and uh, you, you, you feel achieved and you get encouraged. So I'm motivated by uh, seeing people's lives change. I mean, even if it is two people, three people, four people, if you take a decision and you do something that is going to change people's lives. That keeps you going. That, that really keeps you going and, and, and you feel good. And, and, and we live in a society where you meet people every day who walk up to you even in public places, in marketplaces, and they tell you genuinely how their lives have changed or how different they feel because of decisions you made and so on. And I'm sincerely motivated by that. You're motivated by that. I want to bring in another question for you before I throw one over to Joshua. Whoever wanted to clap, feel free to do so. Thank you. Uh, someone is asking here, Dr. Matiangi, how do you deal with failures or wrong choices that you have made? 
How do you deal with failures or wrong choices that you have made? And that's something that every leader goes through. Well, you see, it's the courage to, to learn from them. Uh, because obviously you will not succeed all the time in your life. There, there are times you want to do certain things and they don't quite happen the way you want them to happen or they don't go forward the way you want them to go forward. Or you don't achieve uh, you know, as much as you hoped to achieve in a particular respect. Uh, but uh, failure is also very important because it teaches you and then sometimes it takes you back probably to basics that you may have missed in, in making the decisions that you made. And uh, it also teaches you humility, you know, it, it teaches you dependence. You, you discover that you needed probably to factor in someone else's contribution as you are moving forward. So I frankly don't think failure is a negative thing all the time. And that's what I like to tell the audience, that failure is not a negative thing all the time. It, it, it's good for you, especially if you learn from it. Uh, someone said the greatest hazard of this life is to risk nothing. Because if you risk nothing, you gain nothing, you, you, you don't become anything. So we take risks <laughs> in life all the time. And, uh, and sometimes when you have failed, uh, you learn from it. And uh, I take failure in my stride and, and, and carry on. You take failure in your stride and carry on. Wonderful. I see we've already highlighted one of the questions, which I believe both my panelists can comment on. What is the government doing to create an entrepreneurial atmosphere for the youth? Joshua, do you want to start with that one? I'm sure you have some thoughts on this, and then CS will come in. So, I mean, I like to say that a lot of this has to do with what the private sector is doing. So, I would kind of face it very differently. Across our markets here, enterprise, which is the role that entrepreneurs create business, is really what is supposed to drive the new ideas and solutions for problems. So, for, it's, we are, our kind of cap is actually upside down. We are always waiting for government to think solutions for enterprise. But successful economies in the world today is enterprise looks for solutions. And that's what you see in Far East, what you see in Europe, what you see even part in the United States or North America. So what I would say for us is what are private sector leaders doing to nurture and bring forward a collaboration of, and this is what, why, why I love sitting here with the South Africa because our programs like what you run just three months ago, we sat together with the MasterCard Foundation and said, we will raise hundred million dollar, 10 billion shillings towards developing entrepreneurs, young and beyond, below 30, majority of whom are women entrepreneurs. Over 50, 60% of that wow. are women entrepreneurs. And, we, and, and it's not about our business. If we can build that everywhere, collaboration is something I need to see. And leaders like myself, it's not about what KCB will get in terms of the value. If we can change 100,000 businesses, create a million jobs, that is what shapes the destiny for our economy. So I don't worry personally about how many people bring on board. Now, is government doing an impact? The government was actually, the president was personally there to officiate, to launch that event, what is called a Young Africa Works for the Continent. Now, imagine across the 54 countries, Kenya was chosen as the lead launch for that program to lead the next stage of entrepreneurship in this country. So I, I am very excited to see, that is where I see the opportunity for ourselves. So, will the government do enough? I think we need to nudge forward. We need to create solutions as enterprise. The tragedy is we are always pushing government, yet the solutions are actually on this side of the room. Wonderful, wonderful. And before you hand over the mic, a question that's to both of you. Have you ever wanted to quit your position, Mr. Ugara? So, one of the things in life is I have never really, some words I have never worked with in my life. One is quitting. That word does not exist that in your never vocabulary. That has never, yeah. It's like another question I always get, which is, what am I going to do beyond KCB? And I saw that on the screen. I am so focused today on building a stronger institution of KCB. In my life, I've always focused. And suddenly, kind of some wings come and fly me out to something else. And sometimes we must be so convicted about the change you are making where we are, are. than worrying so much about the next phase. Because God can lift you to a place you have no view today if you focus on what you are doing in your current position. <laughs> Wonderful. And I want CS to come in on that. CS, ever thought of typing a letter one day to the president? I'm done. I want to go home now. <laughs> no, I am. I give up. And until uh, the job is done, I am not a quitter. I don't believe in walking away from challenge. Um, until the job is done. But let, let me comment uh, in a sentence or two about uh, what the government is doing to support uh, youth entrepreneurship. The, the other day we were counting with my colleagues at the um, Presidential Delivery Unit. Cumulatively, we discovered we actually have about 900 million uh, shillings, whether from MasterCard Foundation and so many other foundations and entities that have come in, all of them targeted at uh, supporting uh, youth. 
Uh, there's a tabulation we do sometimes mischievously or secretly when we look at how our president spends his time and the kind of things he does. And I've been telling people, President Kenyatta spends 65% of his time on youth business in this country, whether he's, uh, you know, looking for resources from, you know, financial institutions and so on. Leave alone the funds that we are putting aside as, 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 as government to support uh, young people. Uh, we are the most improved country on the World Bank uh, Index uh, uh, on ease of doing business because we want to remove all barriers and everything that stands in the way to uh, entrepreneurship and investment so that our young people can go in. Our 30% um, uh, procurement ring fenced for uh, uh, young people and persons with disabilities has uh, succeeded but with several challenges which we are addressing from this financial year. And the president is pushing that we go beyond the 30% so that we can provide uh, a wider uh, opportunity for, for, for our young people. And everything else, the mindset of government and the view of government now is to target and focus on how uh, youth entrepreneurship or general entrepreneurship skills will be developed in our country. The very foundation of the competence-based curriculum, the CBC that we are introducing in our schools, is to move our mindset from training uh, our young people to think they are coming out of school to get white-collar jobs uh, than to actually spend time in innovation, creating opportunities, so that we start entrepreneurship and looking for uh, creative ways of uh, uh, earning incomes quite early in life. So there is a complete shift, uh, you know, as, as government, and our focus has totally changed. And we will remain everlastingly grateful to private sector players like the uh, KCB and the others who have come in to partner with government to achieve this vision. As for quitting, I, I, I don't quit. I, I have never even thought about quitting, whatever the challenges are. I believe that um, we were created for challenge, to sort out uh, the problems we, we face and the opportunities we have. And I keep going back to this. We only have opportunities. This is a privilege. To serve is a privilege. And to have the opportunity to assist uh, in solving the problems of our community is one that we should be always grateful uh, to God for. And, and one way of expressing that gratitude is by staying on the task, however hard, however challenging, until it's done. Thank you so much, CS. We'll take that as your last word. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for Interior CS, Dr. Fred Matiangi.